My name is Sal, short for Salvatore, and I was born in Italy, though my family moved to the United Kingdom in the late 1960s. We ran a well-loved Italian restaurant, which became a lifeline for our extended family, including countless cousins who found both a meal and support there. We may no longer be as inseparable as we once were, but we still make a point to gather for family events, especially to avoid the disapproving glance of our grandmother and family matriarch, Connie. Seven years ago, Connie became my wife. We were both around 30 and had both been in relationships that lacked real direction. While those earlier experiences had their fun moments, they didn't have the depth needed for lasting commitment. Connie and I, however, connected on a different level. We spent nearly two years enjoying each other's company, going to parties, sharing laughter, and building a genuine bond before finally taking the next step and getting married. Yet my grandmother, who had been such a key influence in my life, never fully accepted Connie. She was never rude to her, but her disapproval showed in subtle ways. A look that hinted she wasn't quite convinced. Where do women get such intuitions? Sometimes it seemed like she sensed things others couldn't. She even took me aside before our wedding to warn. Keep an eye on her, Sal. There's something I can't quite trust. Those words became like a faint echo in my mind, resurfacing unexpectedly over the years. About a month ago, I discovered that Connie had been seeing someone else. I learned that they'd been meeting every couple of weeks for at least six months. This revelation came after I pieced together some small clues. Oddly, it wasn't as difficult as I'd imagined. One evening, she made a small oversight that planted the first seed of suspicion. She handed me a pen, an ordinary-looking one you might pick up as a hotel souvenir. But the name on it caught my eye because it wasn't from any hotel we'd stayed at. It puzzled me and hinted that something was amiss. Without a word, I returned the pen to her, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I needed to look deeper. Though it was just a small detail, it felt like a crack in the foundation of our marriage. Strangely, I set it aside for the moment. We were heading out to meet friends for an evening of dinner, drinks, and dancing. The usual fun with two other couples. It was a tradition at our favorite lounge, a cozy spot owned by one of my cousins, where we could enjoy a family discount while showing our support. That evening, we were joined by Carlo and his wife, Joanna, and Phil and his wife, Terry. Carlo, who's five years older than me, has always been like an older brother, reliable, protective, and quick-witted. His presence can be a bit intense, something that threw Connie off when they first met. But underneath, he has a gentle soul. His wife, Joanna, with her warm smile and captivating charm, could command his respect in a way that few could, and they made a strikingly devoted couple. And then there was Phil, my friend from work. We're the same age and have similar perspectives, spending weekends golfing or catching up. Phil's wife, Terry, had quickly become friends with Connie. And together, they'd often disappear on shopping sprees, returning with more bags than I could count. Though friendly, Terry sometimes seemed distant, and recently, she'd grown even more reserved. But that night, she was lively, adding warmth to our gathering. At times, I had an inkling something weighed on her, and I'd mention it to Connie, who'd brush it off as typical women's matters. Looking back, those small moments... Terry's distant glances that pinned in Connie's bag feel like pieces of a larger picture I had only begun to see. As we settled into our cozy spot, enjoying cocktails and lighthearted chatter, Carlo and Joanna arrived, greeting us with their usual warmth. Rising to meet them, I hugged them, feeling the familiar ease that came with family. Carlo's presence always carried a certain calmness, as if he had everything under control. Noticing our arrival, the waiter promptly brought fresh drinks. Connie often marveled at the level of service we received. Being family here came with privileges. We were ushered to our usual table, tucked into a corner with a view of the entrance. A choice Carlo insisted upon, though he never explained why. While Joanna and Connie chatted about Phil and Terry, who were running a bit late, Carlo caught my eye with a look that hinted at more than he was saying. He glanced between Joanna and Connie and his expression held an unspoken understanding. I knew Carlo well enough to read between the lines, so I mentally noted to talk to him later. Phil and Terry eventually arrived, but something in their demeanor seemed off. 
They looked slightly flushed, a bit tense. Carlo watched them closely, his face betraying nothing, but his quiet observation hinted that he might know more than he was letting on. As Phil and Terry joined us, the air felt slightly strained. Nevertheless, we dove into the usual topics, work updates, family plans, and the little details of life that always spark conversation. We enjoyed a fantastic meal together, and afterward, the music drew us back to the lounge area. The ladies were eager to dance, and we men soon joined them, stepping out onto the dance floor to keep up with their energy. After a few songs, I noticed that Phil and Terry were lingering on the dance floor, moving together but with an awkward distance between them. The rest of us returned to the table, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. Quietly, I asked Connie, Are Phil and Terry all right? They seem a bit off. Connie shrugged. Terry didn't mention anything, but maybe they've just had a long day, she said, trying to dismiss my concern. But as I looked over at Phil and Terry again, I saw the subtle tension between them. Just then, Carlo nudged me under the table, giving me a subtle signal that he was noticing it too. When Terry returned to our table, she settled in beside Phil, but their body language gave away an unspoken distance. As the evening went on, we continued our usual dance rotation, hoping to lighten the mood, but the tension lingered. When it was finally time to leave, I spotted Connie in deep conversation with Phil across the room. Though my curiosity was piqued, I decided not to ask her about it right then. Instead, we shared our goodbyes and parted ways, each couple heading home. Once we were in the taxi, I couldn't resist asking Connie about Phil and Terry. Do you know what's going on with them? She gave a small smile, assuring me, Oh, they're probably fine. Don't worry about it. But as she looked out the window, her expression softened, as if she, too, felt that something wasn't quite right. I couldn't pinpoint it, but a strange unease settled over me. That night, Connie tried to reassure me in her own way, reaching out to remind me of her love with a gentle, just remember, I love you. Her words were comforting, but there was a glimmer of something I couldn't quite understand. I love you too, I replied, holding her close. You're my wife, and I'm here for you. Always. Despite the reassurance, as I drifted to sleep, memories of the evening replayed in my mind. I knew I had to reach out to Carla the next morning. The following day, Connie left early for the gym. Alone at home, I poured glass after glass of orange juice, trying to shake off the remnants of last night's odd tension. Deciding to investigate, I opened my laptop and searched for the hotel name engraved on the pen Connie had given me. I found its location on the opposite side of London, a sleek and elegant place with on-site parking. Writing down their contact information, I tried to learn more, hoping it would clarify something, but the search yielded little. Just then I called Carlo. Carlo at Sal. What's going on with Phil and Terry? I feel like you know something. Should I be worried? Let's meet up, Carlo replied calmly. Come to my brother's bar around noon, and I'll fill you in. It's better to talk in person. Understood, I said. I'll be there alone. The call ended, and a sense of unease filled me. Whatever Carlo had to say, it seemed like it was serious. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was the start of something big, and a knot of worry tightened in my chest. An hour later, Connie came in, looking refreshed and energetic. I asked about her workout, and she replied with her usual enthusiasm. It was just what I needed, really. I nodded, trying to keep the conversation light, then told her that I'd be meeting Carlo for a brief chat. It won't take long. I reassured her, though her puzzled expression lingered. What does he want to discuss? She asked, a hint of concern in her voice. I took a deep breath. There's been some unsettling tension around, and it started to bother me. I admitted. Her face reflected a range of emotions, but I couldn't quite read them all. After a moment, I got into the car, feeling a growing sense of dread as I drove across the city. When I arrived at Carlo's bar, he was already waiting at the door, glancing around as if to ensure we were alone. I felt a chill as he led me through a maze of back rooms before finally reaching a small, secluded office. Once we were seated, Carlo's serious gaze met mine. I promised your father I'd always protect you, he began, his voice tense. What I'm about to tell you won't be easy to hear, but you need to know. With a solemn look, he reached into his desk, pulling out a large envelope and sliding it toward me. 
My heart pounded as I opened it, revealing photos that made my breath hitch. There was Connie, unmistakably, with another man in intimate scenes captured in a dingy hotel room. Are you okay? Carlo's voice pierced through my shock, but I could barely respond, a storm of questions and emotions swirling in my head. Carlo continued his voice low. A few weeks ago, I heard whispers about Connie acting suspiciously, but I couldn't confirm it until right before our last night out together. The man is Tony Drew, Phil's brother, and apparently, they've been meeting in South London. They thought they were safe, away from anyone who knew them. I recalled moments from the past few weeks, subtle exchanges of glances, odd behavior, things that hadn't made sense until now. Swallowing hard, I managed to ask, so it was happening in that hotel? Carlo nodded gravely. Yes. I had someone monitor them for a bit, and I'm sorry to say, the evidence is clear. I know this isn't easy to handle. Anger flared in me. I want to confront him. I muttered. Carlo held up a hand. Look, I understand, but don't act rashly. It's not worth risking your freedom for them. Better to walk away from her and let me handle him. No. I replied, my voice firm. I need to face him myself. I want him to know that I'm aware and won't stand for this. Can you give me his address? Details? Carlo sighed, nodding. It's all in the envelope. But don't make any impulsive moves, all right? The last thing you need is trouble with the law. Understood. I said, glancing down at the information. Carlo explained that Tony was currently single, often pursuing married women. A pattern that he seemed to enjoy, perhaps because he didn't want to commit himself. Then Carlo asked, And Phil? How close are you two? I noticed him acting strangely around Connie, and I suspect he may know what's been going on. Do you think he's still a friend? I shook my head. Honestly, I noticed it too. If he's aware, I don't think I can stay connected to either of them. The betrayal is unforgivable. I can't ignore what I saw. Carlo nodded in understanding. All right, but take time to protect yourself now. Don't rush into anything. Let's plan this carefully. He placed a business card in front of me. Here, it's a cousin who can help manage this if you decide to make a move. He's discreet and professional. Just say the word, and he'll handle it. I looked at the card and let out a bitter chuckle. Cousins everywhere, huh? Carlo grinned for the first time that day, but the tension between us remained heavy. We spent the next hour mapping out our plan, going over every detail until we felt ready. Then I dialed my cousin Carl's number, arranging to hold off on any immediate actions until we were fully prepared. My next step was to understand just how much Phil and his wife Terry were involved in all of this. As I left Carlo's place, a quiet resolve took hold. When I arrived home, the house was silent, and there was no sign of Connie. In the kitchen, I found a note on the table. Gonna see Terry. I felt a surge of suspicion, but kept my expression neutral as I tossed the note in the trash. Immediately, I called Carlo to let him know. She left a note saying she's with Terry, but I have a hunch she's at Phil and Terry's place while Terry isn't even home. Carlo confirmed my suspicions. You're right. She's at Phil and Terry's and I have someone watching her there. He'll stay as long as necessary. All right, I replied. Let me know if there's any new information. I hung up and looked at my watch, counting the hours until Connie finally returned. When she walked through the door three hours later, she greeted me cheerfully, giving me a quick kiss on the cheek before heading to the kitchen. How was your day? She asked, settling in with an air of nonchalance. It was fine, I said. I met up with Carlo to discuss some things we're working on together. Just a plan to sort a few matters out. Her curiosity was evident, her eyes expectant as she waited for me to elaborate, but I kept the details vague. I wanted to see if she would push for more. After a pause, she asked tentatively, and I answered as casually as possible, saying, It's about a family matter. Our cousin suspected something and wanted advice. I noted the shift in her expression and smiled faintly, watching her attempt to stay composed. I assured her it would all be resolved soon enough. The rest of the weekend crawled by. I could barely bring myself to look at her, much less connect with her intimately. The images of her and Tony, which Carlo had shown me, played over and over in my mind, a constant reminder of betrayal. Yet somehow, she managed to act completely normal, carrying on as if nothing had happened. 
Her ability to pretend to act seemed almost unreal. On Sunday night, her intentions became clear, her body language signaling a desire for closeness. I kissed her lightly, but each time, the thought of her with Tony forced its way in, making it impossible to believe that she could truly be mine. Silence stretched between us as we lay side by side, both lost in our thoughts. Eventually, after she had fallen asleep, I quietly slipped out of bed and went downstairs, burying myself in work at my computer. Just then, a message from Carlo appeared on my screen, a late-night update that fit perfectly with everything we discussed earlier. Knowing the pieces were finally coming together, I resolved that I'd take a short overnight trip on Wednesday and move forward with the plan. In the morning, I took a quick shower, dressed, and went downstairs, where Connie greeted me with her usual bright smile, serving up coffee and toast. As we sat down, I mentioned casually, I'll be heading to Leeds on Wednesday. Her gaze lifted to meet mine, her eyes questioning. Oh, she asked, as if calculating something. Only one night? I nodded. I'll be back late Thursday night, I replied. Her expression shifted, and she pressed a bit further. This wouldn't have anything to do with Carlo and that cousin, would it? She ventured, a slight edge to her tone. Nothing too serious, I said with a shrug. He might just need a hand. I let out a sigh, then continued. Carlo can be intense. You wouldn't believe the things he can handle. He's got a way of resolving problems that makes most people think twice. Her face went pale, her expression telling me that her mind was racing through its own plans. Glancing at my watch, I stood and signaled it was time for me to go. Well, I'd better head out. Take care and don't forget to behave while I'm gone. After meeting with my lawyer, we spent an hour discussing my options and I signed the necessary paperwork. He already had copies of the documents from the envelope and he assured me that everything would be prepared for Wednesday afternoon. Feeling a sense of control, I then headed to the bank and transferred the entire savings to a new account under my name. I also sent a substantial sum to Carlo to hold for me, leaving our joint account untouched, covering household bills. Then, I emptied our safe deposit box of cash and valuables, placing them in a separate bank account I'd set up solely for myself. I even cut off Connie's allowance, knowing that by the end of the month, she'd feel the pressure of her own spending. With a strange sense of satisfaction, I returned to my office and dived into my usual tasks. My secretary, Sadie, was her usual self, unfailingly professional, organized, and subtly supportive. We'd worked together for nearly five years, and she'd always been a loyal, steady presence, even subtly protective of me. Although she was courteous to Connie, I'd sensed tension between them over the years. Connie had voiced her discomfort about Sadie several times, but I'd brushed it off, thinking it was rooted in gender bias. Now, however, I wondered if there was more behind her complaints. As I paused from signing documents, I noticed Sadie watching me with a concerned look. I took a deep breath, and before I realized it, I felt compelled to share what I'd been holding in. She listened intently, and I finally confided, Sadie, Connie is being unfaithful. Her reaction was genuine, shock spreading across her face. Are you serious? She asked quietly, as if unable to believe it. This is terrible. Are you certain? I simply nodded, feeling the weight of it all. Sadie moved closer, enveloping me in a comforting embrace, a gesture that felt both nurturing and genuine. It was the first time since discovering the betrayal that I'd let myself feel the hurt. Sadie's presence brought a sense of warmth I realized had been absent in my home life. She gently took my face in her hands, her eyes full of empathy. You're a good person, she said sincerely. Don't let anyone make you feel otherwise, okay? I looked away, the decision firm in my mind. I'm filing for divorce and ending all of this, I said with finality. Quickly, I added, but Sadie, I don't want you caught up in any of this. I want to shield you from all of it. She looked worried but nodded. Promise me you'll be careful. No das moves. Please. The day dragged on, but Sadie was there to steady me, handling office interruptions with her usual efficiency. I was grateful for her unwavering loyalty, and her presence reminded me that I wasn't alone. Just before leaving, I heard her giving a sharp retort to someone, 
and I couldn't help but smile, glad to have her on my side. At home later, Connie was in front of the TV, a routine night as far as she was concerned. My phone rang, and she quickly slipped into the hallway to answer it. Though her voice was muffled, her tone was hushed. After about five minutes, she returned to the room, but I couldn't ignore the curiosity gnawing at me. Who was that? I asked lightly. Oh, just Terry. Connie replied, sounding slightly annoyed. She was complaining again, and Phil was picking another pointless fight with her. Trying to sound casual, I replied, I hope they work things out. Is it serious? Connie hesitated, looking vaguely uncomfortable. No, not serious. Just a small disagreement, she said downplaying it. I'm sure they'll sort it out. But as I watched her, something about her answer struck me. Is this about what happened at the restaurant? Vos de sleep. Her face registered a flicker of alarm before she quickly composed herself, though I could see her discomfort. It was clear she was spinning a web, and as her lies tangled, I knew she was struggling. The depth of her deception was slowly surfacing, and though I couldn't see the full role of Terry and Phil in this story, it was all starting to take a more revealing shape. I remembered how intensely Phil and Connie had been talking during our walk, their conversation escalating into a tense argument that simmered all evening. So, was that what you were talking to Phil about? I asked, attempting to decipher her intentions. Connie's response was measured, but seemed transparent enough. Yes, Terry asked me to speak with Phil. That's all, she replied. Intrigued, I pressed a bit further. What was it about, Connie? Maybe I could help. A subtle smile crossed my face as I watched her falter, caught up in the strands of her tangled story. Sensing her discomfort, she tried to reassure me. It's fine, S. I think they're close to resolving things themselves. Well, that's a relief, I replied, satisfied with her answer, at least outwardly. But a sudden worry lingered in my mind. Phil isn't involved in something unfaithful, is he? I asked cautiously. Connie quickly dismissed the idea. No, no, nothing like that, she said her voice a bit too quick. I wondered aloud if perhaps it was Terry who might be involved. Connie bristled, her tone tightening. Look, S, I don't know. Let's stay out of their business. They'll figure it out. I nodded, echoing her sentiment. That's exactly what I thought, too. But maybe I'll just touch base with Phil sometime to see if he's okay. Her expression closed off, and she gave me a look that signaled she was done with this topic. A few minutes later, I couldn't resist circling back one more time. So, if neither of them is cheating and Terry asked you to talk to Phil, what was it all about? I pressed gently, but Connie abruptly stood, clearly agitated, and walked out of the room. I chuckled to myself, feeling I had learned enough for now. Still, the role of Phil and Terry remained unclear. The rest of the evening passed in silence, each of us steering clear of further conversation. Determined to address the mystery the next day, I woke early on Tuesday, my mind set on the day's tasks. I left the house, just as Connie was coming downstairs, still looking a bit unsettled. I need to get moving. Lots to do before I leave tomorrow, I said, heading to the garage and letting the events of recent days drift through my mind. Up until last week, life had been relatively calm. That is, until Connie reconnected with Tony. They'd met a few months back on a night out with Terry in a small, cozy club with a few friends. Tony had come over, grinning, and offered to treat the group to drinks. The women responded with friendly smiles, and as the evening went on, Terry noticed a certain spark between Connie and Tony, something unspoken but undeniable. Terry, sensing an air of trouble, felt compelled to warn her friend. Just be cautious around Tony. He's a bit of a charmer, she advised. In the past, he's shown some interest in me as well. Connie laughed it off, relaxed Terry. I have my phone if I need it, and besides, he's charming but harmless. Terry tried to ignore the nagging feeling of concern, but she saw something in Connie's eyes that she couldn't quite shake. Yet the night passed without incident, as far as Terry could see. Still, when Connie was about to leave, Tony slipped her his phone number, a small gesture that only she seemed to notice. Over the next few days, Tony somehow managed to get Connie's number and began calling her now and then, each conversation laced with subtle hints and lighthearted flirtation. When another night out with friends rolled around, Connie knew Tony would be there too. This time, 
They danced, and Tony took every opportunity to charm her with compliments and subtle touches that felt charged with unspoken promises. Leaving with a friend who was clearly uncomfortable, Connie remained quiet. Terry, who was worried, urged her to be careful. But Connie shrugged off the warning. Nothing's happening, Terry, she insisted, though she couldn't deny how easily Tony seemed to draw her in. In the weeks that followed, the phone calls became more frequent, the flirting more intentional. Tony's pursuit intensified, especially when Terry was absent from their regular outings. With his easy charm, Tony persuaded Connie to meet him alone one evening, framing it as a friendly get-together. Connie hesitated but found herself agreeing, perhaps a little too quickly. The occasion felt like it carried a different weight, an unspoken meaning. She left the house with an unmistakable thrill that filled her with anticipation. They met, and the evening flew by in laughter and whispers. Eventually, Tony invited her back to his car and drove to a nearby hotel, confident that this was what Connie wanted too. Their connection intensified, and as their night together stretched into the early hours, Connie was suddenly jolted by the late hour. Frantically, she cleaned up, urging Tony to take her home though the drive itself was sure to take at least another half hour. In the quiet moments that followed, the reality of it all began to settle into place, an undeniable part of their lives now intertwining, leading them somewhere unknown. That night was a wake-up call for Connie, and she started to feel an unease that grew with each passing day. Still, over the following weeks, she continued to meet Tony, unable to shake the draw of their connection. During my absence, Connie stayed with Tony at the hotel, their relationship deepening in ways that concerned her. Terry, worried for a friend, urged Connie to reconsider before things spiraled out of control. Terry even shared her concerns with her husband, Phil, hoping he might persuade Tony to step back. Torn between his loyalty to both his brother and friend, Phil found himself in a difficult position, searching for a way to help without creating greater turmoil. Connie was aware that her connection with Tony couldn't go on indefinitely. The risk and secrecy had only heightened her attraction to him, making it all feel like a dangerously thrilling game. If anyone discovered the truth, it would lead to an explosive fallout. Recent incidents, particularly one in a public restaurant, had raised suspicions, hinting that things were moving beyond her control. She realized Tony's feelings weren't genuine. She was, to him, simply an opportunity. Yet, she couldn't deny the pull she felt toward him. Determined to end things, she decided tomorrow would be their final meeting, but she was resolved to have one last evening together before drawing the line. As she prepared for the evening, an odd sense of relief mixed with her anticipation. She just needed to persuade Tony to agree. Entering the house late, she noticed legal documents from the lawyer in her car, ready to be mailed. Tension settled over me as I reached for my usual comfort a bottle of whiskey. I glanced at Connie, noting her quiet distress, perhaps wrestling with her own thoughts. Are you okay, S? She asked softly. I didn't answer right away, looking into her eyes as I tried to read her expression. She appeared tense, maybe even remorseful. Just a long day, I muttered, heading to the shower, where I stood under the hot water, emotions overtaking me as I thought of everything that had changed. Grief filled me, and I felt an almost overwhelming desire to escape it all. Afterward, I joined Connie downstairs. What's for dinner? I asked, trying to lighten the atmosphere. How about we get takeout, she suggested. Chinese, maybe? Sure, I replied. Dinner passed in silence, the quiet stretching between us as we both held back words we weren't ready to speak. When do you need to leave tomorrow? She asked, seemingly casually. Around nine o'clock. I answered. The flight's at 11 o'clock. It'll be good to meet Carlo. Family is everything. I noticed a flicker of sadness in her expression, as though she, too, knew tomorrow might be a turning point. The next morning, I woke to the rich aroma of fresh coffee, a familiar comfort. Connie was already up, preparing breakfast. The kitchen was filled with the calm of the early hour. I sat with my coffee the silence between us heavy yet strangely peaceful. We exchanged glances but quickly looked away, each lost in our own thoughts. Realizing the time, I stood. I've got to go, I said, 
urgency slipping into my voice. I have to pick up Carlo. As I passed, Connie offered a small smile. Safe travels, she murmured, her voice carrying a mix of warmth and sadness. I returned her smile, feeling the weight lifting slightly as I left. Tears blurred my vision as I drove, the sense of loss overwhelming. Minutes after I'd left, Connie picked up her phone. He's gone, she whispered, speaking into the silence. Are we still on for tonight? The response was instant, reassuring her, and she continued. I convinced Phil to leave us alone. He's been suspicious lately. You haven't heard anything from him, have you? The answer was quick and confident. Yes, but I told him to keep his nose out of my life. I know they're both trying to get in the way, but it won't stop us. I can't wait for tonight, she replied eagerly. Room 45, same place. Just pick up the key at the desk, and I'll be there by 8 o'clock. At the end of their call, Tony smiled, his next move already planned. He sent a quick message, then gathered his listening equipment and left. Meanwhile, Carlo, who was with me, looked at the message with a serious expression. Are you absolutely certain about this? He asked, a note of caution in his voice. You know where this might lead? I looked at him, feeling the weight of everything I'd kept inside. Carlo, I began, I loved her deeply. I've given her my all, and I can't just walk away. She has to understand the gravity of what she's done. Together, with her, I have to do this. Carlo gave me a solemn nod. I understand, S. We still have some time before the meeting, so let's get something to eat. I'll fill you in on the rest. We left the bar, and Carlo introduced me to his brother, Alfredo. Alfredo greeted me warmly, his handshake firm. I've heard a lot about you, S. He said, a hint of a smile in his eyes. It's good to finally meet you. Emilicia, Alfredo's daughter, introduced herself, her smile warm and affectionate. Alfredo pulled her aside, smiling apologetically. Sorry about my daughter's boldness, he said. These kids today, always so confident. I nodded understandingly, appreciating the lively spirit. Alfredo, I'm truly honored to meet you and your family. It's been too long since we've had a chance to connect. Family is everything, as you well know. Please send my regards to your wife and everyone else. Alfredo returned my smile, replying warmly, Thank you. I certainly will. At a little past 3 p.m., my phone buzzed, and I saw it was Connie. Hi, Connie, what's going on? I asked, keeping my tone casual. Just checking you arrived safely. She replied, her voice soft on the other end. We're both fine. Thanks for asking, I said. We're here just having a late lunch before we head out again. What are your plans for the evening, my love? I added, masking my real intentions behind the question. I wanted to hear her reply and see if her story aligned. Oh, I'm planning to visit Terry. I think she's doing better now, she replied. Good to hear, I said, keeping my tone even. Actually, I was thinking of calling Phil later. If I'm not mistaken, he's out with his brother tonight. I haven't had a chance to meet him. What's he like? There was a brief hesitation on her end before she responded vaguely. Oh, I've only met him once, but he seemed nice. I nodded to myself, keeping my voice steady. All right, Connie. We need to check into the hotel before our evening meeting. Have a good evening, and please give my regards to Terry. Love you. Goodbye, I said, ending the call. Carlo looked over, noticing the pain beneath my calm expression. It's done, sir. Let's go meet the others, he said, offering quiet support. Leaving Alfredo at the bar, we moved to the private rooms where Carlo introduced me to four trusted individuals. These are close friends of mine, Carlo said. I trust them completely. They've stood by me time and again, and will do the same for you. Just then, Carlo's phone rang. He answered briefly, then nodded to the group. All right, we're moving out in five, he confirmed. Glancing at my watch, I realized it was already eight o'clock, and time felt as if it were slipping away. We all exited the room and piled into a waiting car. Carlo and I took a separate car, a Mercedes, from the back entrance. We arrived at a quiet street, just 200 meters from the hotel, and waited in silence, the anticipation heavy in the air. Around 9 o'clock, Carlo received a message confirming that our team was already in position. The minutes dragged on until another message appeared on Carlo's phone. We're in place. The exits are covered. Let's go, Carlo said, breaking the silence. I followed him to the hotel lobby. 
my heart pounding as we neared the door to room 415. It was hard to shake the feeling that behind it lay the truth that I dreaded. As we approached, for men dressed in hotel uniforms moved in a place nearby. I took a deep breath, glancing around the empty corridor, before Carlos signaled the nearby security cameras, reminding us to stay cautious. Carlo opened the door, leading the team into the room. As the lights came on, I felt a sudden sinking in my chest. There, in plain view, lay my wife with Tony, unaware of the quiet, unseen approach. The scene froze me, each feeling love, anger, betrayal, competing within me. In silence, I entered, and my gaze met Connie's as she turned, her expression shifting to horror. She gasped, curling up defensively, her face streaming with tears. Her eyes filled with disbelief as she looked at me, and then Carlo, each glance reflecting a new wave of fear and shock. Her trembling voice gave way to a choked silence, her attempts to speak breaking down into barely audible words. Carlo stepped forward and gently took hold of my arm, grounding me as he removed a small item from my grip, his steady gaze urging me to stay calm. The two men by my side stood watchfully, their silence amplifying the unsettling realization settling in on Connie. Her shock gave way to despair as her eyes darted between us, her face shadowed by remorse and regret. Feeling it was time to leave, I caught a subtle nod from Carlo, who checked his phone and whispered, Time to go. I walked out of the room with Carlo by my side, leaving Connie's anguished figure behind. As we moved down the hallway, Carlo quietly remarked, You handled that well. For a moment, I worried you might lose your temper. I offered a tense smile. She'll understand soon enough. The truth will sink in. Carlo nodded. Trust me, sir. He won't soon forget this night. No need to escalate. The message has been received, loud and clear, he assured me. We made our way through the quiet streets, the evening's heaviness pressing on us. When we returned to the bar, Alfredo was waiting a drink ready for each of us. We sat together in a silent camaraderie, letting the evening's weight settle. A new message appeared on Carlo's phone. He read it and gave me a reassuring nod. It's done, he said simply. The team's on their way. The relief was bittersweet as I took a sip, feeling the finality of the night press down on me. Thank you, I murmured, letting the words linger in the quiet of that late hour. That's enough. Carlo interjected firmly, his voice breaking through my spiraling thoughts. It's over now. You need to sort things out with her. I gave a slight nod, feeling the weight of his words. There was no need for further discussion. Everything had become painfully clear. As we left her at the hotel, I couldn't help but wonder what she was thinking, how she would make her way back, and what explanation she might try to give for everything that had just happened. Now she knew that I was fully aware of her actions yet I doubted she would ever willingly confess to them. Carlos' voice pulled me back to the present. Rooms are ready whenever you need them, he reminded me. Despite my exhaustion, I found myself unable to rest. My mind was relentlessly replaying every detail of the previous night, each moment that had led us to this point. Memories of Connie flooded my thoughts, filling me with a mix of love, sadness, and loss. She had been everything to me, and now it felt like that entire world had shattered. There was only one way forward now, to confront her face to face and lay everything bare. I had the divorce papers ready, and they were set to arrive at our house by the time I got home, so she would have no doubt about what I knew. A chilling thought struck me. What if she didn't come back? It added a fresh layer of uncertainty to an already turbulent situation. Knowing I had caught her red-handed, Connie might feel too afraid or ashamed to return home. I decided I might need to change the delivery details for the papers and perhaps send them to Terry's place, knowing it would likely be her refuge. Several hours later, I was stirred from a restless sleep by Alicia's voice. It's nearly lunchtime, sir. You have 30 minutes, she informed me, gently patting my shoulder. Carlo mentioned you have a flight to catch this afternoon. She left me alone to get ready and I slowly moved to an upright position, gathering myself for the day ahead. As I looked in the mirror, the face staring back seemed different, altered by the events of the past 24 hours. 
The familiar features now bore the burden of all that had transpired, and a sense of irrevocable change settled over me. When I joined the others for lunch, there was a strange calm in the room, as if we were all quietly savoring one last moment of normalcy. We ate, exchanged a few lighthearted words, and even managed to laugh, though time felt like it was slipping away too quickly. Afterward, we gathered our things and headed to the car, the faces of those around us watching as we left. As I drove home, dropping Carlo off on the way, his wife Joanna greeted him with joy, embracing him as though it were their first time in years. She turned to me, pulling me into a warm hug, offering comfort in her embrace. Things will be all right. Just remember, tomorrow is a new day. It may seem hard for now, but trust that everything will get better. Carlo reassured me, his words laced with quiet hope. Despite the pain, his support eased some of the burden. I continued homeward, his words echoing in my mind. When I reached my front door, an eerie silence welcomed me. The house was warm, yet it felt devoid of the comfort that used to fill it. I took cautious steps through each room, noting the absence of life. By now, it was already six o'clock in the evening and the emptiness only served to underscore the sense of finality. Connie, if she cared about saving our marriage, should have been home by now. Checking my phone, I found no missed calls or messages from her. Overcome by disappointment and sorrow, I sank into the chair, my gaze falling on a framed picture of us on the mantel. A surge of anger overtook me, and I hurled the photo across the room, shattering it against the wall. The sudden ring of the phone startled me, cutting through the silence. I answered with a lingering edge of frustration. Hello? I said, my voice tense. On the other end, a hesitant voice replied, Is this? I hope I'm not disturbing. Yes, it's me. What is it? I responded, unintentionally harsh. It's Terry, she answered cautiously. Sorry if this is a bad time. I thought you should know Connie is here with me. She's very upset, and I can't get her to tell me what happened. She's too afraid to go home, fearing, well, that you might be angry. A mixture of emotions washed over me, and I knew that anger wouldn't help the situation now. Is Connie there with you, Terry? I asked, managing a calmer tone. Yes, she confirmed, clearly unsettled. Can you ask her to talk to me? I requested firmly. If she refuses, it will tell me all I need to know. Terry's voice was hesitant as she conveyed my message. I could hear mumbling, the faint sound of their conversation filtering through. After a pause, Terry returned, her voice filled with concern. She's not saying anything. Be patient, Terry, I replied, pacing as I spoke. Tell her I'll pick her up. Let's see how she reacts. Terry relayed my offer, but I heard Connie scream in the background. It spoke volumes. Terry's voice trembled as she tried to understand the situation. I don't know what to make of this, she stammered, clearly conflicted. Terry, I know everything, I said gently, my voice tinged with resignation. I know about the past incidents, the arguments, everything. You and Phil tried, I know, but there are some things I wish you'd told me sooner. I don't hold you responsible for Connie's choices, but I think it's best we don't discuss this anymore, I added, the silence stretching as Terry absorbed my words. I'm sorry, she finally whispered. If I could go back, I'd do things differently. Thank you, Terry, I said quietly. Take care of yourself. Please let Connie know I won't be coming to get her, but her things will be packed and ready when she chooses to pick them up. Ending the call, I stood in the empty house, the realization settling over me. This chapter had come to a close. The silence was now my answer, a quiet confirmation of the path forward. If she doesn't act soon, everything will be discarded. I mean it, all of it, I told Terry my voice carrying a blunt finality. Connie doesn't live here anymore. And just so you know, some documents will be arriving for her today. I've redirected them to your address, assuming she might find refuge with you. They should arrive any minute now, I added. Please think very carefully before you contact me again, or anyone else for that matter, I emphasized. Terry's voice softened with understanding. Got it, she replied. After hanging up, I sat in the quiet of the empty house. A heavy mixture of relief and sadness settling over me. The last few days had worn me down, physically and emotionally. Though I knew I'd eventually have to face Connie at that moment, 
The exhaustion outweighed any urge to confront. Still, a fire simmered within, and forgiveness felt distant. The silence was broken by a familiar voice on the phone. Hey, it's Carlo. Are you alright? His unexpected call was comforting, reminding me that someone was looking out for me. I'm fine, I replied, though fatigue clung to my words. It's been a rough day, but I'm in control. Connie didn't come back. She's a Terry and Phil's. Carlo's calm relief reassured me as he offered his unwavering support before we ended the call. As I sat in the house, my resolve grew to see things clearly and handle what lay ahead. I had shared everything with Terry, ensuring she knew the whole truth. By evening, around 7.30 p.m., I anticipated a reaction from Connie once she received the papers. According to Terry, though, she'd arrived at their place looking distraught and unsettled. I could almost hear Carlo's faint chuckle on the line when he heard about her state. It seemed darkly ironic to him. I began to plan for the next day, mentally listing tasks that awaited me. First, checking in with my office, arranging a locksmith visit, handling some banking matters, and planning the logistics for my transition. As much as I wanted to avoid losing her, the trust between us had vanished, and staying in this relationship was no longer an option after I'd handed her those papers. I expected some response from her today, but instead, at around 9 o'clock, a knock broke my thoughts. Opening the door, I found Terry and Phil standing there, an unspoken gravity in their expressions. I gestured for them to come inside, leading them to the living room where we settled in with a sense of quiet anticipation. Terry was the first to speak, her tone sincere and apologetic. We felt we needed to come and apologize. It's the least we could do, she said earnestly. Can we talk? I nodded, motioning for them to sit on the couch while I took the chair opposite them. Phil's voice carried the weight of regret. I'm sorry, Trudy. I should have told you that Connie was involved in something outside your marriage. I've let you down as a friend, he said, his eyes meeting mine briefly before looking away. I'm sorry too, Terry added, her voice thick with emotion. I tried to talk to her, to reason with her, but she wouldn't listen. And now she's with us, still confused. Something seemed terribly wrong when she came to us last night. I could sense the pain in their words, and though I felt deeply hurt, I recognized the honesty in their apologies. Forgiveness wouldn't come easily, but I could see they truly regretted what had happened. What do you mean, Terry? I asked, puzzled and slightly on edge. All I know is that on Wednesday, while the papers were being prepared, I left for a meeting in Leeds because I couldn't bear the thought of facing her. Then you called me. Are you saying something happened between Connie and her? Her friend? Tony? Phil's face reflected a quiet worry. We don't have all the details. I haven't heard from my brother. I tried reaching him, but there was no answer, and he hasn't been at his apartment either. Connie didn't tell us much, only that she felt abandoned, left alone at the hotel. A sense of unease crept into me. The situation seemed more complex than I'd thought, leaving me wondering what exactly had occurred between Connie and Tony. Come on, Phil, I pressed, disappointment clear in my voice. Surely she told you more than that. Something must have happened. Did he, did he hurt her? Phil and Terry exchanged glances, alarmed at the intensity of my frustration. I was usually composed, but this whole ordeal had worn down my patience. Realizing my anger was getting the better of me, I took a deep breath trying to regain control. Aside from Tony, I began, How's Connie doing? I assume she received the divorce papers last night? Yes, Terry replied softly. She seemed composed for a moment, but the papers triggered something in her. She's been unsteady, emotionally distraught. When she showed up at our place, she was clearly upset. Hearing this, a wave of sadness washed over me. Connie's mental state sounded fragile, as though something serious had occurred. Though I was angry, a profound worry began to surface filling my mind with questions about what could have caused her distress and what she might be hiding. Well, she did this to me, so if she's hurting now, so be it, I said, the anger in my voice sharp and bitter. I didn't want to feel sympathy. Not now. Not after everything that had happened. Terry and Phil stared at me, clearly taken aback by the intensity of my feelings toward Connie. Terry's voice quivered as she spoke, trying to reason with me, 
her words tinged with concern. I understand you're angry, but can't you at least try to work things out with her? I mean, yes, she made a huge mistake, but you were so good together. Divorce is such a drastic step. Please just talk to her. She deserves that much. Her words, full of emotion and empathy, seemed to strike something deep inside me. I watched as tears welled up in her eyes, and for a moment, my anger started to soften. I took in what she said. This wasn't just about hurt feelings anymore. There was so much more to consider. This wasn't just about me. It was about everything I had once shared with Connie, and the thought of it being over for good felt like a weight settling on my chest. Terry's voice trembled with sincerity, and in that moment, I realized how much she cared. She wasn't just speaking as my friend. She was speaking from a place of real concern. And though it pained me to admit it, I knew she was right. I couldn't just walk away without trying to understand, without trying to make sense of the wreckage. For a long moment, I looked away, trying to steady myself. Deep down, I knew I couldn't avoid facing Connie forever. As much as I'd wanted to, I had to confront this, and soon, I took a deep breath, my mind clearer than before, and made the decision. All right, Terry, I said quietly. I'll talk to her, but only after all of her things are out of our house. She and I need to have this conversation alone. I'll call her and tell her exactly when and where it'll happen. How does that sound? Terry immediately came up to me and wrapped her arms around me, her emotion overwhelming her. I could feel her warmth, and for a brief moment, I let myself relax into the hug. I noticed Phil watching us, his expression filled with confusion and regret. He hadn't been part of this emotional exchange, but I could see it in his eyes. He was sorry for the part he played in all this. That's all we can ask for, Terry said softly, pulling away from me, but leaving her hands on my shoulders as if to ground me. It's more than she probably thought she could expect. Thank you, Terry, I replied, my voice thick with gratitude. Is Cather son? Just tell her to wait for my call, and don't worry, I won't leave her hanging for long. Phil, ever the quiet observer, spoke up, his voice low and full of remorse. I'm sorry, he muttered, his eyes glancing at me with sympathy. If anyone deserved a good, solid talking to, it was Tony. I wouldn't blame you if you did that. I nodded, acknowledging his words without fully absorbing their meaning. My mind was elsewhere, already consumed with the next steps I needed to take. As Terry and Phil left, their departure felt swift, purposeful, each of them heading off to their respective lives while I sat there, wrestling with my thoughts. Looking out the window, I realized that Terry was right. This conversation with Connie couldn't be postponed much longer. The weight of the situation hung over me like a cloud, and there was no escaping it. Later, I found solace in a phone call with Sadie, my longtime friend. She had a way of speaking to me that always made me feel grounded, and today was no different. We chatted for about half an hour, and I listened as she recounted her accomplishments and adventures in the time we'd been apart. She was doing well, thriving in ways I hadn't expected. It was comforting to hear her, but when she turned the conversation to Connie, I felt the familiar tension return. Her tone shifted, taking on a motherly quality, and I could practically hear the echoes of my own mother's lectures. Don't let this go on too long. You need to have that conversation with her. Sadie insisted. It's time to stop letting it drag on. You deserve closure, and so does she. Her advice was firm, and despite my reluctance, I agreed to join her and her husband for dinner that night. It felt like an obligation I couldn't refuse, and maybe I needed the distraction. The rest of the evening was spent in a blur of tasks. Changing locks, packing or tossing out clothes, rearranging furniture. Each action though mundane, felt like a small act of reclaiming control, of moving on from what had been. But when night fell, I sat by the window, lost in thought. The quiet of the house felt heavy, and though I knew I had to make the call, I couldn't bring myself to do it. I was too tired, too emotionally drained. The conversation with Connie would have to wait until morning. The night was restless, my thoughts swirling around the uncertainty of what lay ahead. Then, just before 7.30 a.m., the phone rang, breaking the silence. Hi, it's Phil, came his voice, urgent and tense. I just got a call from the hospital. My brother's been there for a few days. He's injured, but he's stable. 
That's all I know right now. I felt a strange emptiness at the news. I had expected something like this, but the truth was I couldn't bring myself to care. Don't expect any sympathy from me, Phil. I replied coldly, my voice distant. From what I understand, he was lucky our paths didn't cross. I don't owe him anything. Phil's words fell into the silence between us, and I felt a wave of indifference wash over me. Whatever had happened to Tony no longer mattered. My focus was on what I had to do next, and nothing. No one was going to distract me from that. I understand, Phil replied, his voice calm, yet heavy with the weight of what he knew. He didn't push the issue, respecting the anger that I couldn't hide. I'm not going to ask this question, because I wouldn't blame you if you did, he continued, acknowledging the truth of my feelings. Tony got what he deserved. You're a good guy, a real friend, and I'm truly sorry I wasn't there for you the way you were there for me. I can't fix what's happened, but I thought you should know about Tony. I sighed, feeling a mix of exhaustion and relief. Phil, it's not your fault, I reassured him, knowing he was genuinely remorseful. The circumstances are what they are. We can change the past, but thank you for telling me. Give my love to Terry. Goodbye. Of course, Phil said quietly, his voice still filled with regret. And then he hung up. I placed the phone down slowly, my hand lingering on it as I gazed out the window. The garden outside seemed peaceful, and I let the quiet surround me as I tried to make sense of everything. The birds at the feeder flitted in and out, oblivious to my turmoil. Their simple existence brought me a brief moment of peace, a reminder of a world that was still turning, even if mine had stopped feeling steady. The serenity of the natural world always helped me clear my mind, allowing me to breathe more deeply. It was in these moments of stillness that I could process my thoughts. I reached for my phone and dialed Carlo's number to inform him about Tony. His response was brief, but there was an undercurrent of satisfaction in his words. The job's done well, he said, his approval not lost on me. I put the phone down and took a sip of my coffee, letting the warmth and aroma settle into me. But before I could get lost in the quiet again, the phone rang once more, cutting through the calm. I decided not to answer, letting it go to voicemail. The sound of Connie's trembling voice filled the silence as she left a message, each word laced with emotion. I'm sorry, she said her voice breaking with every syllable. I need to explain. I need you. Please, I'm so sorry. Her sobs made my heart ache, the raw pain in her voice tearing through me. I felt my chest tighten, a mix of anger and sorrow churning within me as I listened to her desperate plea. Each word, soaked in regret, hit me like a wave, and I realized that her remorse was genuine. But it didn't change anything. When the message ended, I sat there, breathing heavily, my mind in turmoil. I knew I had to deal with this, but I wasn't sure how. I didn't want to let her think that her words could undo what had been done. But at the same time, part of me ached for the woman I once thought I knew. For the next few hours, I moved aimlessly through the house, lost in thought. The once familiar space felt foreign now, the emptiness of her absence more pronounced with every passing minute. Where her things had been, there was nothing but space. And it felt like the empty spaces in my heart were growing too. I contacted Sadie for help, asking her to gather a few people with a van to move Connie's things. Within an hour, I watched as boxes and bags filled the back of the van. I stood by, a sense of finality creeping over me as the vehicle pulled away. It was done. That was the last step in our shared life. The last tangible reminder of everything we'd built together. Soon after, I got a message letting me know that Connie's things had been delivered. It was the end of one chapter. But even as I expected the closure, I wasn't sure how to feel. The phone rang again, and it was Terry this time. We got Connie's stuff, she said, her voice steady. Just wanted to let you know it's all here. The guys brought most of it to the warehouse. Thanks for organizing everything. Glad it's all taken care of. I replied, feeling a sense of completion settle in me. We only have the things you marked as personal. She hesitated before asking. I know she called you earlier. Will you talk to her now or later? Call her, I said firmly, the weight of my decision pressing down on me. It was time to confront Connie, 
to bring this painful chapter to a close. I'm ready now. A few moments later, I heard her voice on the other end of the line. Hello, Connie. I greeted her, trying to keep my tone firm, yet not as cold as I felt inside. Oh, I'm so sorry, she said immediately, her voice faltering. You didn't think it would come to this, did you? She sounded almost pleading. I cut her off before she could continue. Enough, Connie, I said, my voice firm but not harsh. You have the answers to the questions you never bothered to ask. This, this is where it ends. She hesitated, her voice desperate. Can we know, Connie, I interrupted. There's nothing more to say. Do you really think anything you say now can change what's happened? Can fix any of this? I could hear the desperation in her voice, and it made me feel sick to my stomach. Can I come home and talk to you? Please? She asked, her words almost pleading, the vulnerability in her voice unmistakable. I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself, knowing this was it. I'll listen. I replied, the weariness in my voice betraying my emotions. But I can't promise anything. I ended the call, the weight of her words still hanging in the air. I leaned back in my chair, my thoughts turning inward. I thought about our marriage, about all the moments I believed we shared, and the happiness I thought was real. But now a new, painful question emerged. How well did I really know her? Were my idealized notions of our life together just that? Idealized? Had I missed the signs of something darker? It was hard to accept, but I knew I couldn't ignore the truth anymore. Maybe I hadn't known her as well as I thought. Maybe I still had a lot to learn about the woman I had once called my wife. And though I hadn't suspected anything until that one night, I couldn't help but wonder if there were other moments, other secrets, hidden beneath the surface that I hadn't yet uncovered. Taking a deep breath, I steeled myself for what was to come. This meeting, I knew, would likely be the final chapter of our marriage, and I needed to approach it with a calm that I wasn't sure I still had. The doorbell rang, echoing through the quiet house, signaling Connie's arrival. I hesitated for a moment before opening the door, and as I saw her standing there, time seemed to stand still. This was the first time I had seen her since that fateful night at the hotel. The memory of that moment still resonated deeply within me. She stepped inside, her eyes immediately scanning the living room. I saw her face fall, her breath catching in her throat as she noticed the empty spaces on the walls. The places where our life, once full of pictures and souvenirs, had been. Her hand instinctively reached up to cover her mouth as tears welled up in her eyes. I could feel the weight of her guilt without her saying a word. It's all gone, I said flatly, bitterness creeping into my voice as I pointed to the vacant spots. If you take a look around, you'll see there are a lot of empty places now. I don't understand, she pleaded, her voice trembling with regret. I know, I replied, my tone cold and unyielding. But this is the consequence of your actions, your betrayal, your affair, your connection with someone else. This is what you've brought on yourself and I hope it fills the emptiness you've been trying to fill. There was a heavy silence between us and Connie, too overwhelmed to speak, sank down onto the sofa. I couldn't look at her without feeling an overwhelming mix of anger and sorrow. All right, Connie, I said, my voice steady but hard. Let's hear it. What do you have to say for yourself? I'm sorry, she murmured, her words barely above a whisper, regret thick in her voice. I couldn't resist. It became like an addiction. The admission stung, and I sat there, battling the emotions that were flooding through me. Was there any part of me that could find the strength to forgive? Could I truly move past this? Connie, just so you know, I spoke to Terry and Phil. I said, my voice filled with a mix of knowledge and frustration. Now I know everything, the when, the where, and even the who, but I still don't understand the why. She fidgeted, her gaze dropping to the floor, unable to meet my eyes. I, I can't answer that, she said, her voice faint, almost defeated. It was just new, exciting. But the fact remains, I said, my voice tightening with emotion. You slept with him, not once or twice, but repeatedly for weeks. How do you justify that? I couldn't hide my disappointment any longer. It was too much. And you expect me to just move on from this? Connie averted her eyes, her guilt all too apparent. 
She was struggling to find the words that would somehow make this right, but nothing she said could take away the pain. I know I can't justify it, she admitted, her voice barely a whisper. I was wrong, and I'm so sorry. But, can we just forget about it? I didn't respond to her question directly. Instead, I steered the conversation towards something else. What about your companion? Where is he now? I asked, my words dripping with the disdain I felt. At once, Connie flinched, the denial clear in her voice. Please don't call him that, she said quickly, her voice breaking. Yes, I went out with him, but I don't have feelings for him. Not really. I love you. I only ever loved you. Her tears flowed freely now, her face stricken with anguish. I made a terrible mistake, and I'm so, so sorry. I sat still, listening to her apologies, but anger surged in me, threatening to drown me. You say you love me, but you've been seeing him for weeks. How am I supposed to believe you? How can I trust your words now? My voice cracked as I spoke, the pain and betrayal seeping through every syllable. You've proven that you can lie to me. Why should I spend another second with you, listening to your words? The tears didn't stop. She was finally beginning to understand the gravity of the damage she had done. The full weight of her actions was starting to sink in, and she trembled, realizing just how close our relationship was to slipping away completely. Well, what about you? I snapped, my voice growing sharper. Did you contact him after everything happened? The question hung in the air, heavy with implication. Connie's response came slowly, her voice shaky, as if she were trying to piece together a story that didn't quite add up. I haven't heard from him at all, she said, tears clouding her words. All I know is he's in the hospital somewhere. That's what Phil told me, but I don't want to hear anything about him anymore. He ruined my life. A bitter laugh escaped my lips, a response to the helplessness I felt. Her gaze flitted around the room, her eyes stopping on the place where our wedding photo once hung on the fireplace. She stood up, her movements slow, as if she were processing each change in the room. The absence of our shared memories was almost too much for her to bear, and I watched as she walked around, taking in the empty spaces where our past had once been. She sank back onto the couch, her shoulders slumped, her despair now evident in the way she collapsed into herself. The silence in the room was deafening, and I could feel the gap between us stretching wider with every passing second. It's all gone, she whispered, her voice thick with sorrow. Is there really no chance for us anymore? Her words hung in the air, laced with defeat, yet there was still a flicker of hope in her eyes. Despite everything, she still wanted us to find a way back to each other. But I wasn't sure I could. Looking at her, I realized how deeply hurt I was and how much the trust had been shattered. Could I ever find it in me to forgive her? To rebuild something that had once felt so solid? Or was it truly over? The weight of that question hung in the air suffocating us both. Taking a deep breath, I looked into Connie's eyes, my own face a mixture of pain and determination. Connie, I loved you with every part of me, I said, my voice quiet but heavy with emotion. But what you did, it shattered my heart. You didn't just betray me, you disrespected everything we built together, all the trust we had. What hurts the most is that you continued your relationship with him so openly without a care for how it would affect me or anyone else who cared about us. You ignored everything we shared, and now you have to face the consequences of that. I paused, the weight of my words hanging in the air. Your lover has already started to pay for his actions. I continued, feeling the finality of the moment pressing in on me. Connie, this marriage is over. I can't do this anymore. I turned away then, the decision set in stone in my heart. I haven't heard from you, so if you sign the divorce papers, we can both move on. I don't want to see or hear from you again. My voice, tinged with exhaustion, was firm, resolute. Everything ends here. It's time for you to leave my house and know this. You won't be able to live in peace in this city anymore. You're aware of my family, of the connections we have. If you want to live a quiet life... Free from the fear of running into the past, you should leave, not just the city, but the country. Her shoulders sagged with the weight of my words, her eyes distant as she absorbed the finality of it all. She seemed to shrink, her strength crumbling as she stood there in silence. After a long pause, 
She slowly rose to her feet, gathering what little resolve she had left. I followed her to the door, my steps heavy, my heart heavier. She opened her car door, and as she turned back to glance at me, her eyes filled with regret. I'm sorry, she whispered, the words feeling empty and small in the vastness between us. Something stirred within me in that moment. Emotions tangled, unsure whether they were anger, sorrow, or perhaps just the last remnants of what had been. She got in the car quickly, not waiting for me to respond, and drove off, the sound of the engine fading into the distance. I closed the door behind her, sealing the final chapter of our marriage. That was it. There was no more to say, no more to do. Two days later, Carlo called me. He told me Connie had left the country the same day, taking only what she needed. His people had ensured she got on the plane without incident. Apparently, she would realized what I was capable of, how far I would go to make sure she understood the consequences of her actions. She knew I wasn't someone who would let her slip away quietly, that I wouldn't let her return to a peaceful life. The decision had been made, and she had no choice but to leave everything behind. As Carlo relayed the final details, I felt no sense of triumph. Only a cold, empty conclusion. The story was over.